He'll tell you do it after he does an intro. I know you're like, I'm ready. <laughs> oh, Allison's great. There's more. There we go. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, we will start promptly at 7 p.m. So as people file in here, um, welcome. For those of you just joining us, we'll start uh, promptly at seven. Thank you. Okay, it's seven o'clock, so we might as well start. Um, welcome everyone to Failure to Execute, a framework for assessing the root cause of technical gaps. By way of land acknowledgement, as we come together for this conference, geographically dispersed but brought together virtually, let me take a few moments to reflect on the, on the meaning of place and in doing so, recognize the territories of the different indigenous groups of where we live and where we are participating in this conference today. These lands are home to diverse populations of indigenous and other peoples. 
We acknowledge and respect the continued connection with past, present and future and our ongoing relationship with Indigenous and other peoples within our communities. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I am Stephen Ross. I am Rowan Terra's Manager of Events and Sport Development. This virtual conference is a partnership between Rowan Ontario and P. Rowing, as well as being supported by Rowan Canada and the Coaching Association of Ontario. Um, on your screen, you will we'll see um, the housekeeping slides. Um, this is a webinar, so your cameras and uh, microphones are disabled. Um, if you cannot view the slides um, in the presentation, they are available in the OneDrive. The link was in the original Zoom invite for this uh, webinar. Um, if you have technical issues, you can use the chat function at the bottom or you can email andrea at rowontario.ca. Uh, questions are encouraged. Um, please use the Q&A function. Uh, you'll find at the bottom of the screen. Uh, yeah, we, uh, the presenters are gonna answer all questions at the end. If you can't get to the answer, because um, we run out of time, uh, they are both available by email. Uh, uh, there was a question in our Q and A already about upvoting. Um, that just means there's a little like thumbs up button at the bottom of the question. It will, if more people click that, the question goes up. If it's the same question you have, uh, this webinar will be recorded, and at the end of the conference, we will be uh, advising you all how you can uh, see the recordings of the conference. Uh, before we get started, I will introduce the panelists and then we can get going. Um, so panelists are Jordan Clark, who is a sports scientist with the Canadian Sport Institute Ontario and the Sports Science and Medical Lead for Run Canada. In this role, Jordan works with the Ontario Next Gen Performance Centre coaches and athletes to coordinate all the nutrition, sports science, physiology and mental performance training. Our other panelist this evening is Dr. Amanda Schwein-Benz. She's the Next Gen Performance Coach at the Ontario Next Gen Performance Centre, as well as an Associate Professor at the School of Kinesiology and Health Sciences at Laurentian University. Amanda has coached for over 20 years at the club, university, provincial and national team levels, and will be Ontario's Head Canada Games Coach for the now 2022 Games. So over to you, Amanda and Jordan. Hello. Um, so this is session number two. Um, so we're going to talk about a framework that um, kind of how we work through uh, assessing where's the best place to put our energy in addressing an athlete's uh, technical gaps. And I'll just slow to respond or it's stuck. There you go. So when we're talking about performance, um, this is a definition from Dr. David Smith, a long time head of sports science in Calgary at the Sport Institute. Um, so it's ultimately what we're trying to do is the ability to maintain technical excellence while at speed, under pressure and when fatigued. So late in the race basically is when we want people still rowing really well. And that's what we're, we're talking about as far as driving performance. So when we get the technical excellence, um, borrowed this with permission from Mike Purser. Um, obviously a lot of different things can go into what is technical excellence in rowing, right? It can be um, a very simple and beautiful sport, yet also extremely complicated if you wanna get into the nitty gritty details. Um, and the bottom bit there is just looking at some of the targets from the peach system, biomechanics um, system for assessing different parts of the stroke, right? So there's different benchmarks and things that um, maybe go into what technical excellence is and what we're hoping to see um, from our athletes um, in the middle of the beginning, end of the race, when the pressure's on. So as Jordan was saying that we're looking at them athletes being able to actually maintain their body positioning, being able to hold technique while they are at rate, while they are at pressure. Some of you may recognize the person on your screen to your right. That's Curtis Holiday. That's Curtis. He's just paddling along there, uh, but he has pretty good body positioning. On their left there, that is Micah Zeman, so that's Carling's sister, but that was when Micah was a novice athlete. So Curtis has spent obviously a few years 
in his development and preparation. This is Micah about three weeks after learning how to row. So we can see that athletes, obviously, they need time to be able to develop proper body positions and they need to be taught those proper body positions. So we have to actually spend time working with them so they know where they should be, whether they're at low rates or whether they're at pace. Yeah, and we see as well, sometimes the athletes can do it really well in practice, um, but as soon as they get into a competition mode, there seems to be a block where technique falls apart or potentially the pressure or the, the fatigue sets in and interrupts this process. So here we've got videos, uh, this is Kate. So you can see in the video on, as they, they come up, so you can see in the video on the right, this is Kate. Well, no, we're, gonna no watch. we're watching one at a time, that's fine, we're in. It's good. It's good to watch Kate in one video at a time. So this is Kate working on the RP3. She's at low rate. She was doing a longer piece. She's been working on sitting up tall at the finish and making sure she's not laying back too far. You can see she's got feet out and that she's driving her legs down. Those are our focuses. Now let's look at Kate at the end of a piece. I'm just going to scroll through a few things. All is good. Here's Kate near the end of one of her pieces. So you can see she's laying back further. Knees are popping up at the finish. She's not able to hold her body position. So this is her fatigued. And you can see by the look on her face that she is fatigued. I'm just gonna check in the chat there and see if people couldn't see the first video. Oh, maybe I'm not. Technology is always the best. This is the most fun. Here we go. It's the video on the right pause. Did we see the first video when she was not fatigued? Someone in the chat. No, okay. Um, let's try this again. Maybe I can reload the slide. Will it work? Okay. Hold on. I'm see, we do... tried to be fancy. I'm just gonna go to the link here. Change what I'm sharing. Give us a second. We do like a little dance that goes along with it to see if that works. We're just pulling up the, the link in, on YouTube. So one of the big things that we're looking at with the athletes, which is really important is, and as we're getting, getting, going to get into this, do they even know they're doing this? And we're gonna get to that point as well. And can they actually hold their body position? So we can see from this first video, that as it's coming up, we can see from the first video that Kate actually can hold the body position. She can actually get to the position that we want her to get to. Now we just have to make sure that she continues to hold that body position. So here we go again, strong body position. She's got feet out rowing so she doesn't lay back too far. She's running at a low rate, so she's not overly fatigued. Now, we'll watch one where she is fatigued. And again, as I was saying earlier, you can see that she's laying back further, her knees collapse at the finish, so you're seeing them buckle, her back collapses. And this is just something that we're working on obviously with her. So we know she can do it. That's positive. We just have to train, get her to train to hold that body position when she's at pace and when she's fatigued. All right. Okay. So this is where we get to the framework with, um, how do we figure out why the breakdown is happening? What, what part of her development do we need to focus some energy on to get the most change um, for our time? Um, so this came from a conversation that we had with uh, Speed Skating Canada's men's track endurance coaches and physiologists. Um, and we just had a little bit of a knowledge share session and this was just something that really stuck with me um, from one of their coaches. Um, and it was this model of why um, they might see the technique break down late in the race or in training. 
Um, so it focused on three things, the ability to actually do the skill or execute the skill, the awareness of what the skill is, what's supposed to be happening and apathy. So if it's an ability limitation, um, the athlete's got something that's stopping them from being able to do it. Awareness is they don't, they don't, maybe don't know what they're supposed to do, or they don't know, um, that they're doing something wrong. Um, and apathy is they're not bought into trying to work on that. So if they're not trying to change it and you're, you, you give them the best cues and drills in the world, but if they're not trying to make that change, then you're not going to be successful. So this is Alex and well, we're going to start with ability. So can the actually the athlete actually perform the action that you want them to do? And we're, and we're using Alex as a really good example. Alex is a young para athlete that I've worked with for a number of years, and Alex has cerebral palsy. And you'll see in the video when we're talking about ability to actually do a movement, there are certain things because of Alex's cerebral palsy and because of, of the way his body is structured that he can't do. If you take a look at his right arm, you can see that Alex has his fist a little bit more clenched and his right arm a little bit bent. That is his natural body position, okay? But Alex has also worked incredibly hard at being able to hold it. So he's, you know, he's seeing the picture. It's a really great picture of him standing up really straight. He has very good posture. He's been working about that. So we're gonna show you a video of that. Hopefully this one works. Okay, so if you take a look, I mean, we always, when we look at videos, we can see a whole bunch of different things that don't, aren't perfect, right? So let's not focus on that. Let's just focus on when we're looking at Alex's right arm. So Alex's right arm actively will not go straight. Passively it will, but actively it will not. So as you can see that in the video, so he's always going to need to work on that, okay? So that's the ability component. Now, it doesn't mean he doesn't try. He is trying to get it straight, but there is a limitation towards his physicality. Done. Okay, so the next um, little piece of this puzzle is awareness. Um, so again, kind of mentioned, does the athlete actually know what you're asking them to do? Um, are they aware of the importance of it? And are they aware of what they are or, or are not doing? Um, so I captured this picture of Al Moro um, back at Western coaching the lightweight women last fall. Um, and the first session, he sat them down in the boat bay here in front of the chalkboard, pulled out some oars and actually showed them how he wanted them to pick up the oars where on the, the handle their hand should be, where the crossover should happen if they were sculling. He did the same thing with sweeping um, and walked through exactly what he wanted to see. So it gave them the ability to understand and create a picture before they went out on the water of what was expected and what he was trying to get them to do. Um, versus if he would have gone out in the water and then seen a bunch of different problems going on and started cueing and trying to fix things, it's very possible that the athletes can misinterpret your cues or your instructions. And if on the fly in the moment, they're trying to take your words while they're moving, while they're tired and create a picture for themselves of what it's supposed to look like, that picture may not be accurate, right? So when we talk about awareness, it's making sure that the athlete's got the right reference picture or the reference image of what they're trying to do, right? And understanding why that's important so that when you're cueing it, they're not just trying to execute the cue, they're trying to actually execute the task. Um, so what I mean there is like the, the point of, you know, getting a good blade entry and getting connected early is to ultimately to propel the boat more, right? So if they just focus about getting the blade in quickly and they just chop into the water, maybe they're getting the quick blade in that you've asked them to, but they're not actually achieving the task of getting connected and having a nice smooth catch that helps propel the boat. Um, so just from a motor learning perspective, we want to make sure that they've got the right kind of reference image that they're comparing what they believe they're doing um, to the proper thing and trying to execute the right thing while maintaining its relation to the specific task or outcome that we're trying to generate by doing that. And one of the ways to help with this is to actually 
allow the athletes to get feedback directly for themselves. So Fulker Nolte has talked for years about the importance of the NK Orlocks and he's really liked using them. We hadn't used, I had never used them before and they were new to us here at the center and we bought four of them this year. If you have the financial means to be able to purchase these or purchase one of them, they are fantastic. So on the left, you'll see the picture of what that NK Orlock looks like. And on the bottom right, you'll see the different numbers we've got there. So you've got your catch, your slip, your finish angle, your wash, all, all the data that sits in there. So what we did was we put these on four athletes who we knew would have the ability to be able to take the feedback from the Orlock. Because what happens is you put the Orlock on, you sync it to your GPS stroke coach, and it gives you immediate feedback. It gives you immediate numbers for every single stroke. So we picked athletes that we knew would be able to take that feedback and be able to implement that into their stroke. So we had one athlete uh, and it's an athlete, his name is Lucas and Lucas is 14. And we put the Orlock on Lucas and we said, okay, Lucas, lay back as far row normally and tell us what your finish angle is. So he was rowing along and he said, oh, okay, uh, my finish angle was uh, 48. I said, okay. I said, fantastic. Why don't you go to 40? He's like, okay. So he went to 40. It was really short. He said, well, that feels really weird. He said, okay, how about you go to 46? Try that. So we tried that. He said, it still feels really weird. So then we showed him some video and we showed him the differences in his body angle. And we also took a, took a look at the the uh, boat speed. And by using the feedback from the Orlock, he could understand now, we'd been working on him sitting up taller at the finish. We'd been working on him pushing his legs down. We had worked on a lot of different things to get him into a proper finish position. And he was trying really hard. But by giving him this data, he was able to say, oh, I now understand where you want me to go and I understand how that feels. So with three days of using the Orlock, he completely changed his stroke and adjusted to what we wanted to see. He then came back and said to us, wow, my back doesn't hurt as much. I feel like I can roll for a longer time. I can hold my split better. I feel like I can keep up. And we were seeing a big improvement in his rowing stroke. So again, the awareness, it's not that he wasn't trying. He was totally trying. He tried everything we asked him to do and he was doing a great job. But by just giving him the data, it gave him a completely different awareness where it's like, ah, yes, I understand now. And so it helped him significantly. So this can be part of awareness. We can do all the coaching we want, but sometimes they aren't necessarily understanding. Back to Jordan's point, they may not be comprehending exactly what we're trying to say or the importance of this. So now when we look here, we actually had uh, Will George come in and Will George works with CSIO. He's a biomechanist and he came in and, and did some biomechanics work with the athletes on the team. And this was awesome too, because again, Greg and I had been coaching the athletes and talking to them and, and asking them to do certain things. And they under, said they understood what we were saying and we actually had, and this isn't about Abby, we actually had one athlete who was working with us and Will Turnaman said, right, so it looks like you are, um, you're, you're, uh, you're opening up with your back at the catch. Have you heard that before? And the athlete turned around and said, no, I haven't heard that. And I looked at him and I said, what do you mean you haven't heard that? I say that to you every other practice or every other stroke. He's like, oh, that's what you meant. So with this biomechanic feedback, similar to what we saw with the Orlock, this gives the athlete very specific feedback where they can say, when we're asking you to do something, this is why. So let's just take a look. I've asked the athletes that were showing, I've asked them permission to be able to use their data. So this is Abby. Abby is a lightweight rower. This is a thousand meter piece that we were doing. And, and, and these are the, this is the kind of curve that you get back. So the curve on the left, the gray one, what we're looking is for the ideal, ideal curve, okay? So the far left of the, of the graph, 
that's where you're actually taking the catch. The blade should go in the water. The curve should go straight down and then straight back up. The narrower the gray part, the light gray, that's the more consistent. So you can see that Abby, Abby isn't as consistent with her entry into the catch, but she's pretty consistent when she picks up the boat and she starts to drive, okay? So entry isn't, again, consistent, but really consistent when she starts to pick up the boat and actually initiate her legs. And that was something we were working on into the catch. So Will provided feedback there. So again, it's just another voice saying the same thing. He says, oh, well, it looks like you're not approaching the catch properly. It looks like you're lunging a little bit. You're trying to take the catch a little bit with your arms when you really should be a little bit more fluid. We're not seeing the drawing of the boat underneath you. Again, something we had been working on with Abby. But by being able to see this, Abby got immediate feedback from Will. He then, when we don't have the video of it because it's far too large and we couldn't actually include it on, the, on this. But the other thing that was able to happen is Will came out in the boat with us and we could get this exact curve and videotape Abby at the exact same time. So we're seeing real time reactions. So as soon as she was having a good stroke, he immediately gave her, good, he immediately gave her feedback of that was the curve that she wanted to see. And so she knew right at that point, okay, this is the feeling that I want to be getting. And it's not that it's different from what the coaches are saying. It's just another piece of data to be able to support the athletes. Okay, so the third um, piece of this model is the apathy, right? So is the athlete, do they actually care about making the change um, that they're doing? So maybe they're perfectly able to execute that skill or maybe, maybe they've got some work to do, but they're not willing to put in that hard work um, do the extra stuff like stretching and mobility work to get there um, or they just don't think it's that important they don't believe that it's actually impacting their performance All right so one of the classic examples um, that i've observed over the years is the posture of specifically the low back right whether that you get that rock over um, of your pelvis to protect your lumbar spine right so this is just our posture grading scale from our monitoring camps um, and often you see athletes camp after camp or a five or a four, right? They're down there. They're not putting in any work to move more towards a one, uh, more ideal position for force transmission and longevity uh, without getting hurt. But if they don't, if they're not actively trying to work on this, it doesn't matter what we're doing as far as prescribing stretching or mobility work or um, cueing it in the boat. If they're not actively trying to make that change, they're never going to make this change. So that's the, the third kind of category that we would lump a limitation into is, is apathy. And hopefully through the education and the awareness piece um, and the relationship building with the athlete, you can um, hopefully weed this out. But again, if you've got an athlete that just doesn't care about one aspect, then maybe not worth the amount of energy you could put into something if they're not trying to, to make the change with you. Maybe you invest that energy somewhere else and build that relationship and trust and they come back to to these things later and they're willing to, to trust you because something else worked out. So some of the tools that we use, uh, we've talked about a couple of them. Um, so the Orlox and the, the biomechanics report there, um, we do a gap analysis with all of the athletes. So there's technical and tactical feedback from the coach on a scale of one to five. How are you at executing these things? Um, you know, this is a bit of a reality check for some people to find out that they're, they only do a skill on a scale a five at a level of a one or a two. Um, and it makes it really easy to start that conversation about what the gaps are and what you need to work on as an athlete or what we need to focus some energy and training on. Um, we've got some self-assessment. Um, so we've got a nutrition um, survey that they fill out and questionnaire um, that can flag stuff for our dietitian to pick up on and have a conversation about. Um, how are they about taking care of their stuff? What are they doing outside of sport that gives them some life balance, time management, um, all the physical testing. So we've got the radar and camp monitoring on here. It will include their strength testing um, if they're doing it. Um, some of the detailed biomechanics numbers will go in to it eventually. Um, but it basically lets them know how they're tracking relative to, to what their goals are. And in the bottom corner, we'll get into these a little bit more detailed coming up. But the rate speed assessment is a great tool that uh, our performance analyst in Victoria helped us develop um, to track technical change. Um, 
but another big tool that's free and out there is just go watch some good rowers row. Um, so video of yourself, great video of even like crewmates and like, what do you see your crewmates doing wrong, which may be a dangerous path to go down if they're in a crew boat, <laughs> but other people assessing, assessing experts, isn't always the best way to learn from video, but you can definitely learn a lot, um, from watching some of the best rowers. And I would say a great tool for a coach to have is no, maybe who's closest to executing the strokes that you're trying to coach. If you can show, if you're trying to coach your scholars to row like Kim Brennan, get them to watch videos of Kim Brennan, right? So that they understand they've got that reference image of what the stroke is supposed to look like. What are they, what are you trying to get them to do when you cue um, different things during the stroke? Um, so a good example of this is back to Lucas, our little 14 year old, um, obviously can't necessarily handle the same training loads as some of the older athletes. So one Sunday he texted and said, I'm, I'm too tired. I can't come to the second or third practice today. Um, and so Amanda texted me and said, Lucas is tired. And I said, okay, well, he's 14. Tell him to go home and have a nap and then wake up and watch the videos from the junior European championship and see if he can figure out why the winner one and beat the people that he beat what's the difference in what they're doing All right so just that exercise for lucas was great because then he's starting to think about okay why is that guy growing so fast or why is he faster than the other people right and it's not that level it's not just about who trains more or who's fitter right there's some technical act elements there that he's probably doing much better than the person that came sixth um and immediately that week lucas started making changes so Powerful tool, I think, especially for the young athletes to have a good image of what they're supposed to be trying to do. Um, so we can look a little bit closer at the gap analysis. We won't get too much into it. We've presented it before. Um, so the technical tactical stuff comes from Rowing Canada's gold medal profile. Um, can they scull? Can they sweep? Can they hold the oar properly? Fascinating how many people don't have a correct grip on the oar. Um, posture, length of strokes, and obviously some of these things can get broken down into, into smaller details, um, but we didn't want to get too granular. Um, some tactical stuff, do they understand the rules of racing can be a big one um, so they don't get themselves in trouble out of regatta. And I kind of talked about nutrition and self-care and stuff like that, but you know, a big one for us is rowing can be expensive, especially if you are trying to do some international events. It's not cheap to be on the junior team for three years and then the under 23 team for a couple of years, right? When you've got to pay those assessment fees. So, um, you know, knowing, do we need to balance a part-time job or something into your, into your plan and development and understand that this is going to be something that we can't sacrifice just to, to chase the training, right? We've got to have a whole picture view of the athlete and know what the uh, potential limitations are. So another tool that we have is what's called the rate speed assessment and Jordan mentioned it. Uh, so this is Madison. Madison is also a very young athlete. She's 15. And Madison, when she first started rowing with us, would really like to just row at a higher rate and keep things moving. And we tried to explain to her and we, and she still works on it very well. Tried to explain to her that we want to have the rate lower and that we wanted her to get more distance per stroke and that this would improve her efficiency. And it's not that she didn't believe us and it's not that she didn't try, she absolutely did, but she had come into a habit that this is what she, she was used to. Now, before I get into exactly what we've got here, this also leads to a point that, that Jordan has mentioned as well is, you've gotta make sure that they understand, and he talked about this one with uh, the picture of Al, you have to be very clear of what you want because you don't really know what previous athletes, what previous coaches have worked through. And especially when you have a lot of turnover in coaching, coaches always have the best intentions and they do their absolute best, but they may have missed a small point and they may have, have missed saying something and it could even be just carrying the oar. So you want to make sure that you're very clear with athletes because you don't know what they don't, that they don't know and they don't know what they don't know. So really make sure you're laying things out. And by providing details like this, they can actually see things a lot more clearly. So in this rate speed assessment, what it is is that the athletes do a 2000 meter piece. They do the first 500 at, in this instance, first 500 at 18, second 500 at 20, next five at 22, next 250 is at 24, and then the next 250 is at 26. And what we get is they're using on their GPS stroke coach 
and then we see what they're, how fast they're going for each one. And what you can see from Madison's is that she actually isn't going any, she didn't go in this workout, she didn't go any faster when she took the rate up until she gets to about 24 and a half, but we're not seeing an appropriate level of increase of boat speed. So that's the bottom right hand side. We're not seeing appropriate um, or ideal boat speed increase as the rate in increases. So meaning she needs to learn how to create and generate more power through distance per stroke and how to maintain that as she increases her rate. Just for orientation, this piece one, this first graph here is just their speed relative to the prognostic speed for that rate. So at rate 19 and a half, her speed was 69% of what it should be. Um, and she kind of holds that level. Um, and then she does get a little bit of a bump at the higher rates. And then the second graph is based off what she does in the first 500, everything is ranked off of how much um, the model predicts she should increase um, by those rates. So when she went up to 20.5, she only achieved 96.5% of the speed that we would expect based off of her speed at 19. And the same thing, we only got 94% of the speed we would have expected at 22.5 from what she got off of her first 500 in that piece. Okay, so another big tool that we use is movement screen. So this is the updated one. You should recognize most of it from Coach Weekend 1, I think. Sorry, Colleen Miller. Uh, <laughs> anyways, um, so I'm going to, I was technically involved, but Tricia um, McBride at Western Victoria, the Rowing Canada physio, did 95% of the work in updating this. Um, so we're not going to get into this because it's a whole presentation on itself. Um, but it's developed in order to assess the range of motion and some of the physical capacities you need to be able to do to execute the positions that we ask athletes to do in the boat. Um, so it's all about their ability to, to move their body in a way that gives them the freedom to achieve those positions. Okay. So we just wanted to go through a bit of an example. Um, so in this scenario, um, the athlete has been struggling to hold their posture and connection through to the release. Um, they're able to do it in sessions when they're cued for a short period of time, but then it starts to fall apart. And so we're going to work through what some of the maybe limitations are for this athlete and how we might investigate that. So from the ability, is it an ability issue? So uh, we've done the movement screen um, and we saw there's maybe a bit of a core muscle endurance challenge um, in the push-up test and the active straight leg raise test. We saw that they're, they're challenged to execute those movements. Um, and then in the finished position assessment, we can see they're actually quite comfortable sitting in the position we want them to be in and moving in and out of it. Um, so it's not necessarily a range of motion concern, but we're seeing potentially um, some core muscle endurance issues in holding that posture and position. From the radar testing and other physiology testing, um, this young athlete shows that, yeah, like their endurance is not well developed. Um, they're pretty powerful, but um, not a lot of endurance. Um, so obviously maybe we see one minute and 2K are pretty decent and 6K starts to fall off a little bit is what we would see in the radar. Um, and we can, they can do it in the boat in short stints as was in the scenario. So we know that they can physically do it. Um, and yeah, so summarizing all that down at the bottom there. So awareness as the coach, have we cued them repeatedly? Have we cued them properly? Does the athlete actually understand the, what we're trying to get them to do when we're cueing on the water? So maybe we're doing, uh, we've cued them when they're sitting still and they can actually hold the, the finished position, but as they're rowing away, we can't cue them and make them understand exactly where we want them to be as they're rowing. Are we providing them the opportunity to do drills every day? Are we giving them the chance to work on that to ensure that Again, they understand the importance of this and where they actually need to be. Again, back to the biomechanic analysis, do you know, <laughs> easy here again, or I'm sure your coach mentioned this. No, they really haven't. Oh, wait, actually that's what they meant. Because let's be honest, let's be totally honest. 
we can say the exact same thing. Like Jordan and I can be in a room talking to the athletes and we can say the exact same thing, but I become like the, uh, the teacher from peanuts, right. Where all they hear is wah, 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 where Jordan will say literally the exact same thing and they get it. Or Will will say the exact same thing. And it doesn't matter that they get it when Jordan or Will says it. What matters is that they now understand. So even though we've repeated different, said it different ways, we've repeated it over and over again, someone else may help them and get that. And that's really great. And then it comes into apathy, right? So are they actually trying to make the change? So do they want to? So they are, okay, so we've got here, you know, either they're trying to make the change, but don't have the core. Okay, so maybe they don't have the ability. Well, we've, we've addressed that they may have the ability or may not, may not be able to sustain that. Do they need strength and endurance? Okay, but do they understand the importance or do they turn us and be like, no, listen, I'm going fast enough already. You don't know what you're talking about. When I try it, I start going slower. And this is one of the problems that we see with athletes is, and we've all seen this, right? We ask someone to make a change and then they go a little bit slower and they turn this and say, but you told me I'd go faster. We have to remember that learning and development, it's not, it's, it's, the line doesn't go straight up, right? We have ebbs and flows. So yes, you might get a little bit, the athlete might get a little bit slower, but the projection of where, how much faster they could get is really important. And they have to be aware of that, but maybe they don't trust you. Maybe they don't see it. So having tools for them to be able to understand why this is important is key. And do they believe you? That's really important. So that is, Jordan talked about that. That's really important that you develop that relationship with the athlete, that they trust you. Okay, so to kind of summarize this scenario, um, some of the things we would do. Um, so we use the feedback tools, um, have some discussions about it and try to remove the ambiguity. Um, so they have a clear focus and a clear reference image. And this goes, you know, when you've got access to a team of support staff, right? It gives the athlete and the coach a minimum, uh, potentially the strength coach you're working with or a therapist. Um, if everybody knows what the main targets are, um, we get aligned approaches and the strength coach is doing stuff specifically to help address um, the issue at hand, right? So for this athlete, it might be working on core exercises targeted at the deficiency, which is resisting uh, flexion of the spine, right? So maybe instead of some general core exercises or some med ball throws for great rotational power that are fun, let's maybe be a little bit more targeted in where the athlete's falling down a bit. Um, potentially you're selecting strength exercises that help reinforce the principles, um, making sure we continue to develop endurance um, and you know, this is a big one is breaking work into manageable chunks where the athlete's able to maintain that deliberate focus. So if I want 60 minutes of C6 or 90 minutes of C6, it doesn't have to be 90 minutes on the ERG. If they can go and give me 10 really good minutes on the ERG or the RP3, and then go 20 minutes on the bike, and then they can come back and give me another 10 really good minutes, technically, from a physical physiology development, it doesn't need to be always specific, right? So if we're trying to learn skill and trying to make technical changes, they're not going to do it when they're tired and just taking hundreds and thousands of bad strokes is not going to magically turn into a good stroke one day, just because they're a little bit fitter, right? They've practiced that bad stroke now, probably more than they practice good strokes. Um, so limiting them to um, taking good strokes, where, and maybe it's a mental focus limitation as well. Like how long can they focus on that change? Um, depending on what it is. And that is all. I think it's probably some questions. Uh, hi guys. Uh, we have one question here and I'm sure it, others will have questions. I actually have one question as we're going along with this, but let's say, let's uh, go with uh, question one here. Uh, what is your experience with slash opinion on arguing at a high rate with low damper uh, C6 for 28 to 32 for maintaining technique at higher rates and or reducing fatigue at higher rates. I'll let the physiologist deal with that. Um, I haven't worked with any coaches really that have done a ton of that. Um, had a couple of interesting discussions. Um, again, because I haven't really 
tested it out. I can't say one way or the other for sure, but um, one of my reservations would be that while you're getting the specificity of the high rate, if you've got no resistance with it um, or don't have the pressure, you're not necessarily getting the same specificity of the force production, um, the pickup, the same motor units recruited, even though maybe the speed helps with that a bit, but the intensity isn't necessarily there. Um, I think maybe in short spurts, if someone struggles to, to do the high rate stuff, taking some of that load off could be good um, just for the kind of coordination of the, the technical elements. Um, so I think maybe from a technical tactical side, um, maybe some benefits, but I wouldn't base too much of my training around it. But I think it's important to do high rate stuff enough, not just in the lead up to the, the big competition. Um, I'm a big proponent of it being mixed in all year round. Um, and, and the polarized training model, I guess, is a lot of low end aerobic training, but there's gotta be some high end training as well. Okay, hopefully that answered Julie's question. Um, we have another question here from Peter Cookson. Jordan, what is your opinion on polarized training for rowing? Does it apply to younger and newer athletes as well as older ones? Could the introduction of polarized training help with some of the three pillars of failure that you mentioned? Yeah, um, so if you're not familiar with polarized training, um, it's popularized by Steven Tyler, but it was basically analyzing um, Norwegian endurance athletes, largely cross country skiers who pretty much dominated the sport um, and looking back at their training journals, but it, it basically found an intensity distribution about 80% of the work done um, below the first lactate threshold. Um, so below two minimal, so Royal Canada C6 training for 80 to 85%. Um, and then another maybe 10 to 15%, but we would call C3, C2 training, and then only five to 10% um, kind of threshold training. So in that middle zone. And so the, the theory of the coaches it was that you got too much fatigue from threshold training, um, that it wasn't worth maybe the benefits from the fitness side, right? So by polarizing, they were able to do a lot more volume, accumulate a lot less fatigue. Um, and because you had a lot of the low end training plus the kind of VO2 max area training, you're getting kind of a push and pull of the lactate curve and developing stuff from both ends. Um, I mean, it's definitely the model that I most work with. Um, seems to be working for, for the athletes that um, I work with. Um, I would say the maybe the flip side of that is that there's lots of young athletes that are in school, maybe working jobs as well that don't have time to have a volume based approach. So they could maybe benefit from being on more of a threshold um, approach. If they're only training once a day, um, potentially there's a case to be made for, for mixing it up and not, you've got to do a lot of volume of the C6 stuff to really for it to pay off. Um, so if you're, not able to do that, then I would say there's maybe some other methods you could follow. Um, but you can also mix it up throughout the year. And you know, when they've got more ability to train then do a more volume based approach. Um, and I think it, how it fits in with that kind of apathy awareness ability. Um, I think depending on what what the issue you're talking about is and what maybe the root cause of it is, maybe helps select what the appropriate way to load the athlete is. So someone who doesn't um, have the range of motion to get into the good catch position and roll forward on the pelvis, you know, do I wanna put them on a ton of volume if they're training almost exclusively on the earth? Probably not, um, just asking for trouble. Um, so I think that's kind of where it fits in with this model of, you know, depending on what you think the fix is from your toolkit, um, based on what you kind of diagnose as the limiting factor, um, might help select what the appropriate loading method would be.
Okay, we have another question here that was in the chat. It says, I've worked with the idea of coaching balance, technique, and then power. Blades off the water is a difficult stage and impacts improving technique and power. Is there a part of technique that you harp on regardless of the experience level of the athlete? I think it depends on the athlete. Um, so we're very much a balanced technique and power. We try to make sure that the strokes that they're taking are quality strokes. We don't just want them taking strokes for strokes sakes, but we're going to see different issues, physiological issues with different athletes, depending on what they can and cannot do. So we want, I mean, I personally, not every person does this, but I personally start with the finish. So if you can't sit up at the finish and you can't hold your body up at the finish, then I'm concerned about them being able to get up to the catch where other people may start at the catch because if you can't position yourself properly at the catch, how do you propel the boat through the water? How do you then actually come to your finish? I, I don't think there's a right or wrong there. I think you need to pick where you want to go and commit, believe in it and, and have the athletes believe in that. So if you want to, if you want to start with, you know, just making sure that they can sit at the catch and bob their blades, go for it. Fantastic. If someone, I, I would like to sit at the finish and make sure that they can actually bob their blades properly and hold their posture. It, again, not a right or wrong. It's more of what are you going to, what are you going to buy into and believe is going to be the most important for that athlete to be successful. Okay, great. Um, I don't see any other type questions right now. Um, I have one question. Uh, how's the best way to address apathy? Oh, drinking. Oh, sorry. Not that. That's from the coach. Um, I think you gotta understand it and maybe try to understand what's causing it. Yeah. Right. Like, so it, I guess it would be different if they're, you know, they don't care about it because they're, you know, they're just here to have fun and, whether they're fast this way and they just, you know, they're got three more months in the sport and then they're finished their last CUs and they're done. Right. You're not probably not going to get much change out of that athlete versus someone who's, you know, driving to in two years, try to make the national team. Um, right. So what's the cause of it? Like, are you actually going to be able to address it? Um, or is it, you know, a lack of understanding that, yeah, you're big and strong now, but in, two years, everyone you're racing is also going to be big and strong. Um, so this is really going to be a problem. And if we spend two years just ignoring it, it's going to be an even bigger problem. So I think that would be my approach anyways, is try to understand why they're not trying to work on it. Um, and if it's, you know, if it is a not understanding the importance or not buying into the importance, um, like I said, depending on where you are in your relationship with that athlete, maybe it is time to focus your energy on something else and help them have a breakthrough somewhere else. And then say, yeah, well, you'd have an even bigger breakthrough if we addressed this issue. I even as, as well, there talk to the athlete, there might be a reason they don't want to make a change. So I'll give you an example. And Curtis is an example. Um, so Curtis, when he came back from the Paralympic Games, so he was very successful, had won a bronze medal, did an amazing job. And he was rowing in a very different stroke than I had. Um, when I look at it, it wasn't something that I exactly wanted him to row like. So we sat down, we talked about it. And I said, okay, how do you want to row? How do you, what is your national team coach? Cause he was going back to work with John. What does John want you to look like? What does John want you to row like? And maybe there was, and, and so we had a really good conversation of what, what worked really, really well for him. And so with through that communication, we were then able to come to a compromise of, okay, this is what you're trying to row like, here's what I'm seeing, let's put that together. So it, that communication is super important and an understanding, again, it may not be apathy. It may be that they don't understand. It may be that they've heard something that in their mind, even though it may not be, it could be conflicting in their mind. So we need to be able to talk, to talk to the athletes and have open conversation with them because they're very bright. They know what they, they know what they've heard. They know what they're thinking. And so we just have to talk to them. Uh, 
in the comments here or in the Q and A here, we have a comment from Tony. I don't think apathy lasts very long. As a coach, we should not assume the athlete is being apathetic until a lot of strokes have been taken. Yeah. Um, then right. we have another question on the topic of apathy motivation. What have you found to be a good motivator for your athletes who are not aspiring to make a team? Um, yeah, I would say to Tony's comment, um, absolutely. I, if we presented it and you it thought that we we're assuming that they're apathetic about it or they don't think so. I, I think through the conversations on the awareness piece and the gap analysis, like we start to have conversation, like it's, those are all just conversation starting tools, right? So we, you know, we're going to have a meeting on Wednesday and we're going to tell an athlete that you're a one out of five on this skill, right? And they're going to, you know, we're going to talk about it, right? And, and how they rate themselves on it, what they think about that, um, right? And so I would never assume someone's not trying to make the fix, right? Like, just because they don't have a physical limitation that's stopping them from getting in a position um, or a fitness limitation from doing it, like maybe they've got some kind of weird mental block um like you've seen golfers with the yips right there's no reason like they used to swing the club beautifully and now they have some weird hitch in their swing and they're not trying to do it they don't they definitely probably care that they're doing it right but there's other reasons um right so it's just um i think the the only one that i think i see persist is kind of that the example that i gave is that posture and the rock over right there and there's i've definitely seen athletes that can do it that choose not to because their interpret interpretation of what the Danish four was doing was rowing with curved backs. And so they want to row like the Danish four. Okay, great. Well, if you actually look at it, it's a lot of thoracic curvature in those athletes, not so much lumbar. And, you know, for some of those athletes, we put them on force plates and got them in different positions and showed them like a 20% increase in force when they sat with the proper posture. And that was the, Oh, okay. Maybe I'll not try to row like <laughs> the video I saw on YouTube. Um, maybe I'll try to row the way that was more powerful. Um, so absolutely not, not meant to imply that we're assuming because our three tests showed that there wasn't something else going on, that they are being apathetic. Um, but it is something to consider like and more so like, and I don't think rowing is necessarily a sport for people that are full of apathy. Um, so I think there's just a few things that, you know, and sometimes you see it with like young early developers that are big and strong right and they they focus more on that like, i can rip a really strong 2k based off of my power um and strength um, and they don't necessarily invest the time and energy into rowing a little bit better and cleaner to get to julia's question as well it's bits back to communication i think it's really important to ask the athletes and this is what the gap analysis is what is that what are you trying to get out of this if you're here to have fun and hang out and splash around and laugh awesome that's awesome and so as the coach you need to be aware of that and and be aware of your expectations on that athlete support the athlete in what they want to achieve if the athlete tells you they want to make the national team then you have to have a conversation with them of okay well what does that mean what does that pathway look like? What do you need to be doing? So there needs to be lots of communication. A uh, couple of comments here in the Q&A uh, from Walter. Yep, possibly the athletes also don't understand what you're saying, and that can be translated as apathy. Um, John says, I think the apathy is the wrong word. <laughs> so I don't know if you, what you, John, what you think the right word is there, um, but uh that was just a comment. And we have another question here from Greta. After pulling data from the water through Orlock, uh, biomechanical analysis, et cetera, how can you bring the data directly to the ERG when trans transitioning off the water? So what we've tried to do is actually show video. We start with video. So I take video, we've taken video of them on the water and then when they and show them what that looks like, we've showed them what that looks like with the, the biomech. And then we take video of them constantly while they're, they're training. So they'll do a piece, then they'll, as soon as they're done the piece, there's a video that's sitting in their inbox waiting for them. And that's me standing there taking a video. And so they get videos throughout the workout, not as they're erging that they start looking at them, but they've done a 20 minute piece. They look the, the video, we talk about it for a second, then they try to work on it. So that's where we're trying to show them that feedback. I think on the apathy being the wrong word, um, maybe you could substitute 
buy-in or a concept like that, right? Are they, are they bought in to making that change? Are they actively trying to do it? And if you want to call it something else, it's fine. I'm just literally use the words that um, the speed skating coaches um, shared with us. Um, so um, yeah, certainly if apathy doesn't ring true for you, if, if it's easier to wrap your head around, is the athlete buying into, are they actively trying to make the change, even though you're queuing it, if they're not trying to do it, um, I don't think they'll, you'll be successful until you find a way to get them to try to change it. Um, even if you've got the, the perfect cue or the perfect analogy or whatever to, to illustrate what you want. Um, right. If they're not trying to do it, they're not going to do it. And it's kind of the point. And I, I don't think that that's, I think a, a small minority of the cases is the athlete not trying to make the change. I think, a big one is awareness. I think just maybe the way that some of the athletes are introduced, right? We get 20 kids out to a learned row. It's hard to take the time to make sure they fully understand what they're trying to do from the beginning. Um, right. And then just as you go, you, you're fixing one problem at a time kind of thing. Right. And so they're picking it up piece by piece. Right. So sometimes we assume they know something they don't. Um, sometimes we think that we've communicated something effectively and we haven't, which is, probably pretty common which is you know the the stories of the athletes hearing it from will or myself and greg and amanda have been telling them for weeks right it's maybe just the words and i've had that as an athlete right just yeah i think everybody as a coach has had that that yeah you, you <laughs> can say something 20 times and all of a sudden somebody else comes in and and all of a sudden Magically, it's fixed. Um, we have another question here that appeared in the chat. Uh, what app do you use to take video? Huddle question. Uh, so we use, okay, so simple ones, just use your phone. Um, another one is you can actually, I mean, I had Jordan come out in the coach was with us the last day we were training and he actually used you know, a handheld um device that actually zooms in so but you don't need anything fancy just your phone is enough your phone or if you had a tablet that you're out there and you feel comfortable with it use that but just your phone you can use it, most phones you can actually slow them down and that works perfectly but it, even if it's just really simple basic they see themselves rowing that works really well it doesn't have to be fancy. It honestly doesn't have to be fancy. It could be really simple because they can't, they think they're doing something right. But then, then they see the video. They're like, oh, that's not what I thought I was, I looked like. It's like when you're, you're saying in front of a mirror, right? Or if any of you have been to a dance class or a Zumba class or anything like that, not in the last, you know, since March 11th, but uh, if you've been somewhere and you see yourself in the mirror, you're like, oh no, that's not what I thought I looked like when I was doing it. So it's the same thing. Any video that you want to use, works it doesn't have to be fancy okay we're coming up on the eight o'clock here um i do there's another comment the coach's eye is a good tool i don't know if either of you ever use that yeah it can work really well okay if there are no more questions, I think we're going to wrap this up for the evening. Um, great discussion. Um, we th This is now our second of five uh, presentations. The next one is on Wednesday on Safe Sport. Um, you should have received an email this afternoon with the Zoom link, and we look forward to seeing you all then. Have a great Thank night, you. everybody. Thank you, Mandan Jordan.